OK. <coughs> So let's move on to the uh, more similes about uh, impermanence. Uh, the radiance of all the stars is not worth a 16th part uh, of the moon's radiance. So the moon's radiance is said to be the best of them all. Uh, in the same way, when the perception of impermanence is developed, it has all of these uh, consequences culminating in eradicating the conceit, I am. Yeah, so the moon shines, yeah, the moon's brilliance, the moon's is what helps you see on the moonlit night. If you go into the forest, you can see what's going on in the forest because the moon is so radiant. So the stars help you see a little bit, but only tiny bit. The moon is what really helps you to see. In the same way, the perception of impermanence helps you to see the nature of reality. It illuminates the mind, clarifies, it gives you vipassana. This is Vipassana practice, you know? You know that venerable? Yeah, yeah this is kind of, this, to me, Vipassana practice. Uh, so you practice, you see the, you develop the per perception of impermanence. Uh, that is a kind of Vipassana, I reckon. Yeah. <laughs> no, you know, you can develop, it, it helps to have some of that, but these things you can also develop in daily life, right? Uh, they go together. They kind of build up together. Anyway. After the rainy season, the sky is clear and cloudless, and when the sun rises, it dispels all the darkness from the sky as it shines and glows and radiates. The perception of impermanence is like the sun blazing in the sky. Isn't that a nice, that's a nice idea, isn't it? It says something about the power, dispelling the darkness from the sky, dispelling the darkness from your mind dispelling the darkness from existence uh, as it radiates and blazes and uh, destroys the little uh, crooks and crannies where you cannot see properly. Uh, nooks and crannies, I should say. Yeah. Mm. In the same way, when the perception of impermanence is developed and cultivated, it eliminates all desire for sensual pleasures. Uh, for rebirth in the realm of luminous form and for rebirth in a future life. It eliminates all delusion and eradicates all conceit, I am. So uh, it's a little bit strange, that conceit, I am. And in English language, usually conceit means that you think you are superior. That's usually what it means. You're conceited about yourself. You think you are better or whatever. But so how is I am, how is that a conceit? And uh, it is a conceit in the sense that it is a, an illusion. Yeah, it is just like I'm superior is an illusion. Uh, in the same way, I am is also an illusion. You're adding to the experience. Uh, but I'm wondering whether conceit is such a great translation because uh, it's kind of a bit misleading. Yeah, conceit it doesn't mean you feel you're better. It just means you think you are. That's all it means. Uh, Asmimana, mana can be mean pride, it can mean arrogance. So it is in that kind of area, the arrogance I am. I am. Ha. <laughs> anyway, just a bit of food for thought. Oh, are you okay? You're going to live a little bit longer? You're going to, yeah? I hope so. <laughs> okay. Okay, good. <laughs> so we hope for the best. It is for the retreat. Okay, good. Yeah, you, can, you, you have the right attitude. Excellent. Okay, excellent. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, so... Um, and now we come to the last part of the sutta. How is this perception of impermanence developed and cultivated so that it eradicates the conceit I am? Yeah. So how do we do this? And this is now we come to a very standard way in which this is uh, done this is the usual way you find in the suttas. Uh, yeah? Such is form, such is the origin of form, such is the ending of form. Yeah? Form, rupa, and uh, as I mentioned before, the uh, a nice translation of rupa is actually appearance. Uh, yeah? So such is appearance, such is the origin of appearance, such is the ending of appearance. Uh, and so this is like, usually refers to kind of a, you know, your form, your, your person, yeah, who you take yourself to be. When you look at yourself in the mirror, you think, that's me in the mirror, yeah? 
And some days you think, oh, I wish that wasn't. No, <laughs> I wish that wasn't. Some days you are kind of happy what you look like. Other days you're not so happy. Yeah, it depends on the circumstance, all these kind of things. Uh, and the form, this appearance arises in the world and then it uh, disappears. Uh, and uh, so such it is. This, this is what it means. Uh, it arises and disappears. Uh, so this is a very practical one to contemplate. Yeah, You can see the changing uh, of things. Uh, and this here is very similar to the contemplation of old age and death and these things. Uh, it's a very similar kind of thing because form is very affected, of course, by, by precisely by that. Uh, such as feeling, such as the origin of feeling, such as the ending of feeling. Yeah, yeah so feelings come and go. Uh, and uh, just having starting to get an understanding of feelings. Uh, and uh, a very important part of all of this is uh, understanding the causality uh, behind these things. Uh, and understand that things arise because of cause and conditions. Uh, and then they depart when those cause and conditions come to an end. Uh, those cause and conditions are not in our control. And that is kind of one of the main reasons, uh, main problems with this. Uh, so when you feel things, uh, you can't control it. Uh, even if you try to control it, uh, you can't. Yeah? So I, I can have a cup of coffee now. As it trying to control the feeling, right? Uh, but now it's gone a little bit cold already. Then where? What <laughs> the heat only lasts so long, right? Then impermanence comes and snatches it away. The feeling is a bit disappointing now compared to what it was before, yeah? Feeling arising, feeling going away. Uh, cause and conditions causing these problems. Uh. And so feelings are not under our control. Uh. A little bit under our control, but generally not. Uh, and think they will kind of come and arise according to their own cause and conditions. Uh. Yeah, perception. Uh, you know, and, and uh, remember I was saying before about the kind of large scale uh, idea of impermanence in the whole world, in a sense. Well, this is not really contradictory to that uh, because feelings, well, feelings arise in relation to everything in the world. Yeah, you turn on the TV, you see something bad and you feel bad. Uh, so that also relates to that. So everything really comes together. Five khandas really is everything, uh, it doesn't exclude anything. Uh, Perception too, right? Perception involves the whole world. It involves everything that we try to make sense of in the world. Uh, everything we see, everything we hear, everything that comes through the six senses uh, is perceived. Uh, that's how we make sense of it. That's how we know it is, a, it is existing. Uh, and we, that's how we relate to it. Uh, it arises, it goes, it comes. Uh, perceptions are impermanent. Uh, yesterday, today you are my friend. Uh, yesterday, tomorrow you are my... Uh, even more friendly, yeah? <laughs> I was going to say enemy, but I can't. That's, that doesn't sound nice. So I say even more friend uh, to, tomorrow. So, uh, yeah, but perceptions of the world changing all the time. Uh, yeah, coming and going. Uh, and this is kind of the problem. Uh, war and peace, uh, friends and enemies, uh, uh, earth element, body. Yeah. Such are choices, such is the will. Yeah, such as the origin of choices, such as the ending of choices. Uh, um, our choices are also out of our control. This is a very interesting point. Uh, we cannot choose our choices. Uh, yeah, this is kind of a very interesting idea that uh, our choices, what we choose in the world, are formed by cause and conditions. Uh, and this is this idea that there is no free will in the world, according to Buddhism. Free will is kind of an illusion because our choices come about because of cause and conditions. We don't choose our choices. Such as consciousness, such as the origin of consciousness, such as the ending of consciousness. So this is kind of coming to the very core part of what it means to be a human being. And that too arises from cause and conditions and ends when those cause and conditions come to an end. So, um, yes, uh, so there you are. Uh, um, I'm trying to get kind of keep control over time, but I get very confused because I, I, I can't remember. Anyway, we, go, we carry on a little bit longer. Uh, so, there, there you are. That is how the perception of impermanence is developed and cultivated, uh, so that it eliminates all desire for sensual pleasure, for rebirth in the realm of luminous form, for rebirth in the future life. Uh, that's how it eliminates all delusion and eradicates the uh, feeling uh, or the perception or the conceit uh, or the pride or the arrogance uh, I am. Okay. So um, 
There you are. So that shows you, gives us a little bit of background uh, on the idea of impermanence and how powerful it is. Uh, uh, and now what I'm going to do next, I'm going to look at the, some similes that we find in the suttas. Uh, that probably those of you been around for a while, you probably know these similes already because you, you know, these are kind of similes that you will often hear about. Uh, but they're very interesting similes. Uh, and they are essentially about the impermanence and the non-self nature of the five khandas. Uh, does everyone understand the five khandas? No? Don't the five khandas? Okay. So the five khandas are, in a sense, the way that the Buddha divides up a human being. Yeah, He divides a human being up into five aspects. Uh, and these five aspects are called the five khandas. It means like the five groups or the five heaps. So there are five groups of uh, of uh, various aspects of a person. The first one is appearance, yeah, what you appear like. Yeah. Second one is feeling, whether it's good, bad, or neutral. Uh, the third one is perception, how we, our ability to relate to the world, to make sense of the world. Uh, the fourth one is uh, choices, or the will, or intention, uh, depending on how you want to translate it. Uh, the last one is consciousness, which is just awareness, which is just our ability to know anything at all. Uh, as what is the last one. Uh, so five Tandas, uh, and we're going to go through them in detail and uh, have a look at these um, uh, similes for the five Tandas. Uh, so this sutta is uh, called the uh, Penupind Upama Sutta, uh, uh, a lump of form, the simile of the lump of form. Uh, is found in the SN, which is the Sangyuta Nikaya, the connected discourse of the Buddha, 22nd Sangyuta, 22nd chapter, which is the chapter on the khandas, the five khandas, uh, the five aspects of personality, sutta number 95. And uh, I don't know, it's one of these uh, suttas that really stand out because it's uh, quite unique, and that, that's what makes them really interesting. Uh, uh, but it's unique in a sense, not that it is dodgy and kind of you, you know, you don't find it anywhere else, uh, but more like it is. Um, uh, interesting, because I think it exists also, as far as I know, also in the uh, Chinese version of the sutta as well. So it exists in other schools of Buddhism, uh, and as such, it is very likely to be an early sutta. And it doesn't have any strange things about it. Uh, it's all kind of very uh, orthodox in many ways. Uh, so, Pena Pind Upama Sutta. Okay, so let's have a look. At one time, the Buddha was staying near Ayodhya on the bank of the river Ganges. There the Buddha addressed the mendicants. Yeah, so the, uh, the river Ganges has always been there. It existed at the time of the Buddha, obviously. It exists now. And uh, the Buddha would often stay in places along that river. For example, Varanasi is on the river Ganges. Uh, uh, and then you have a place called Ayodhya. I think Ayodhya, no one knows exactly where it is. Uh, um, so it's kind of one of those uncertain places. Uh, but the, they would all often uh, stay on these rivers. And what is interesting about the Buddha, he would often use the landscape around him to create similes. Uh, yeah? He would look at the mountains, look at the forests, uh, look at the monkeys and the animals and all these things, and also the river. And the similes would emerge out of his observance of nature, always using nature to create similes. And so when he's on the bank of the river Ganges, there's a reason why this is mentioned, because the similes come out of the fact that he's staying on the river Ganges. And if you ever have a chance to go to India, the river Ganges is like a really awesome sight. So this enormous river, right? You... If you go to Patna, for example, Patna is uh, uh, the ancient, same as the ancient Pataliputra, which used to be the ancient capital of the Magadan um, uh, kingdom at that time. Uh, and today it is called Patna. You can see Pataliputra, why it becomes Patna. There's obviously a continuation there. And then that is where we often cross the river Ganges. If you travel between, for example, uh, you, from Rajagaha and you want to travel to Vesali, and usually you, you cross the river at Patna. And there's a bridge going across there, and this bridge is two kilometers long. Yeah? yeah, because that is kind of how wide the river is, two kilometers wide. And so if you think your rivers in Malaysia are large, yeah, this is like a real river. Yeah, this is the real deal. 
So it's probably one of the very largest rivers in the whole world, basically, the Ganges. It's an enormous thing here. And it's really kind of awesome to get there. And then you kind of then you read, read the story of the Buddha. And of course, the Buddha also you know, had to deal with the Ganges River, right? Uh, so in a sense, this is one of the feelings you get by visiting India. And that I'm kind of selling the upcoming pilgrimage. You come along with me. <laughs> This is one of the things, when you come to India, you can, it's like you're stepping into the story of the Buddha, you're stepping into the biography of the Buddha, and you recognize the landmarks, yeah, the Ganges River is there, you go to Rajagaha, in Rajagaha you see the, Rajagaha is also called the Giribhaja, Giribhaja means the hill fort, because it's like a fortress, and the city is in the middle, and you recognize the various hills, and you recognize the, the details of the landscape, they are still there in the present day, yeah. And so if you think that the suttas sound a bit like fairy tales or mythology, the moment you come to the India, it starts to become real. Yeah? You realize, actually, the Buddha was actually here. That's what you start to realize. The Buddha was a real human being traveling in this part of the world. Yeah? So this is the beauty of this. Yeah? So you're going to come along now? <laughs> There's only so many places, you know. As you have, <laughs> Anyway. My probably all probably all used up already, so I, I shouldn't I shouldn't advertise something which doesn't exist. Uh, so I, uh, anyway, okay. So let's have a look at the uh, at the similes of the Buddha. Mendicants suppose this Ganges river was carrying along a big lump of foam. Yeah, you know how rivers can sometimes have lumps of foam going on them. You have probably seen this. Uh, yeah, so the lump of foam coming along the river, very common, common sight, sometimes because of pollution or whatever. And even at the day of time of the Buddha, probably there was enough pollution already, right, uh, to kind of form these lumps of foam. Okay, then a person with clear eyes would see it and contemplate it, uh, examining it carefully. Yeah, so when you see a lump of form, just don't think, yeah, or whatever lump of form. No, see it with clear eyes. Yeah, contemplate it and examine that lump of form because then you will actually understand the nature of a lump of form. If you just say, yeah, yeah, whatever, you will never actually have any idea of the nature of these things. You will not say you have to have clear eyes. So, what is that in Pali? Uh, so, we will see whether Y Yin or I am the quickest one to find, it, find out which it is. Uh, we will. Unfortunately, I'm still on the spike nard page. So I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm a bit challenged. <laughs> Link suttas, suttas, uh, where are we here? 22 aggregates. Uh, you're not competing with me. Why, well, you're very, very wise of you. You're just relaxing. <laughs> Say again. Ah, you are, you are so, you're such a, doing the right thing. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, okay, so here we are. Can you even see this? Probably not. Uh, probably too small. Uh, and now it's more like it, right? Uh, so here we have, yeah, with clear eyes, you see over here. And then we have the Pali, which is just after uh, Ah, Chakuma. You see it down there? Chakuma, that's the clear eyes. So it just means someone who has eyes, basically. Yeah. And uh, so he would see, see it, right? Uh, and then he would uh, contemplate it. And this is the word you have down here. Nijayaya. This is contemplate. Uh, yeah, this is related to the idea of uh, jayati and even jhana. Would, uh, actually, nijaya means to see something and to accept something because of your views. You are viewing it. Uh. And then you have uh, examining it carefully. Yeah, see up here, examining it carefully. That here is yoniso uh, upapari, upaparikeya. Yoniso is like wisely. Uh, upaparikeya is to kind of uh, observe or to look upon something or to even to stare at it or something like that. Uh. Yeah, so these are the words. Yeah, so now you can learning learning a bit of Pali on the way. Is it handy? Yeah. yeah so these are now. You, <laughs> so these are the Pali words, and then it starts to make a bit more sense once you start to understand the Pali. See what's going on there. So, and so the point is that whenever you want to understand something, yeah, you have to contemplate it. You have to examine it. Yeah, carefully. Yoni so. 
Dioniso has the idea of source. You're going to the source of something, seeing its root, seeing where it's coming from, why it exists the way it does. In other words, it's an aspect of wisdom. So whenever you do this, this is an important part of this particular sutta that we have to investigate, you have to examine her. And what is the best time to examine her? After coming the mind. <laughs> is that right, Venerable? What is the best time to examine her? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm being naughty. I'm just kind of coming back to the Vipassana and some of that thing, you know. So, yeah, don't worry. No, I'm just. <laughs> I, I, I learned from Ajahn Brahm always to take every chance to be naughty. That's what Ajahn Brahm says. So, so you're always kind of. <laughs> otherwise, life is kind of boring if you're never naughty here. Yeah. <laughs> and then he says, and it would appear to them as completely void hollow and, and, and insubstantial. For what substance could there be in a lump of foam? Yeah? So what is the Pali here? The Pali words here are ritaka. You see here ritaka over here. This, this nieva on the ending doesn't really matter. It's just an additional little word. Ritaka means hollow or empty. Yeah? Tuchaka over here also means hollow and empty. Yeah? Ah. Uh, asaraka, sara, we had before, we were talking about heartwood. Heartwood is sara, so that means it doesn't have any heartwood. Yeah? It is, in other words, it's hollow again. Yeah? So these three words here are synonyms often used together with sunya or sunyata. They're very closely in meaning to that. Rittaka, putchaka, asaraka. Do you like Pali language? It, no, no, don't like Pali? Okay. It's kind of nice. I think it's quite nice, isn't it? It's the, Ritta kanyeva kayeya, tutcha kanyeva kayeya, asara kanyeva kayeya. <laughs> this is a Pali. So if you learn a bit of Pali, then you can go to India and you can read the signs on the streets because in India the meanings are still largely the same when you go there. And so when you examine the lump of foam, yeah, you see it as void, hollow, and insubstantial because foam is basically just air. Yeah, there's nothing really going on there. It is just air, and then it's kind of moving and changing, and eventually all the bubbles, eventually they all kind of disappear, and then it's gone. Yeah, no substance, nothing is left. Nothing actually remains of, the, of these bubbles. And so then the Buddha makes the comparison. And he says, in the same way, a mendicant sees and contemplates any kind of form. And so form here means any kind of appearance in the world, anything you see in the world past, future, or present, uh, internal or external, coarse or fine, inferior or superior, near and far, and far, examining it carefully. Uh, and it appears to them as completely void, hollow, and insubstantial. Uh, for what substance uh, could there be in form? Yeah, so he compares form uh, Anything you see in the world, including your body, the, your body has a certain appearance and form, uh, all of that is empty, uh, hollow, insubstantial. Uh, just four elements, rising out of four elements, and going back to four elements later on. Uh, and again, you see it and you contemplate it. Uh, and you will notice here that what it says, and this is really the, kind of the important point here, all form, yeah, any kind of form at all, sabbang, rupang, uh, all form is included there. And then it gives an idea what it meant by all. Yeah? All here includes past, future, and present. Uh, so it doesn't mean just what you see now. It also means that anything you may fantasize about the future, uh, in the future I will have such form, yeah? or in the future I will whatever, enjoy these sights or whatever. In the past, oh no, in the past I had all these wonderful forms. Yeah? In the past I was young and beautiful. Now I'm old and, and not so beautiful then. Uh, yeah, or whatever. Things kind of changing. Yeah, yeah? moving along in this way. Yeah? So any kind of form that is, whether it is uh, fantasized about it in the mind or whether it's presently apparent to us right here and now, uh, all of this is part of this. Uh, internal or external. Internal means relating to you. Yeah, your own form and appearance. External means everything in the world around you. Whether coarse or fine, this can mean coarse, Form can mean, well, like we would normally talk about coarse and refined things in our society, 
but it can also refer to like uh, uh, the, the ordinary material body of a human being and a fine material body of like a devata. Yeah, devatas also have form uh, or appearance, uh, and this goes all the way up to the very kind of high uh, deva lokas. Uh, all of that too uh, should be considered as a lump of form. Uh, just because you are a deva doesn't mean you should be conceited about your appearance, uh, yeah, or your form or whatever. Still, it is uh, like a lump of form. Uh, Inferior or superior, similar kind of thing, yeah, yeah. devatas and, uh, you know, better or worse and these kind of things, uh, yeah. Near and far, it doesn't matter where you travel, where you go, it doesn't matter if you, if you even travel to the deva loka, still the same kind of problems. All form is included in this. Nothing is excluded, and this is a very important point. There is nothing excluded from these things. These categories are complete. And this becomes particularly important when it comes toward the end of the five khandhas, like consciousness. Uh, there isn't any consciousness excluded from, from this particular examination that we're looking at now. So everything is included. Uh, so you examine it carefully. And when you examine it carefully, you see it like a lump of foam. Uh, yeah, it's actually hollow. Uh, there's nothing really there. There's nothing that you can hold on to. As soon as you hold on to the body or appearance, it slips through your fingers. Uh, yeah, this is who I am. Oh no, I'm changing now. Who am I this one? Or am I are you the person you are now? Or are you the person you were 20 years ago? If you look at yourself in the picture 20 years ago, guaranteed you look different. Let alone 30 years ago, let alone 40 years ago, let alone 50 years ago, let alone a hundred years ago, let alone a thousand years ago. What did you look like a thousand years ago? That's a good question, right? You don't know. But you probably looked like something, probably quite different from what you are now. Who are you? What is this appearance? Is it really real? Is it ever? What about the, what you look like in your next life? Are you going to be sad about what you have lost in this life? No, you, again, you will have forgotten it. All these things we are attached to, there's nothing really there. It's insubstantial. It slips through our fingers before we know it's gone. And then we wonder, why do we attach in the first place? There's nothing really there going on. It's hollow, it's void, it's insubstantial. There's no essence to these things. So that is form for you. So uh, for what substance could there be in form? Like a lump of form on the river Ganges. What is the nearest river to here, Niwana? The Klang River. Klang River. Okay, so you go and check the Klang River. Look for form. Contemplate the form. No form. But it's brown. It's, it's too brown. But there must be some form as well, right? On the brown top of the brown. Yeah. So next time you have a chance, go to the Klang River and check out the form. Yeah. Plastic. Yeah. Okay. That it's not the same. Plastic has a feeling of enduring, right? That's the problem with plastic. Yeah. So form is better. Yeah. Ah, so do, do some washing, get some, dish, some washing liquid uh, and then foam it up. Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's do some meditation together. Okay. Oh, and let us uh, do some questions or comments, please, if you have anything you'd like to ask about. Somehow I have also learned from Abhidhamma rather than Sutta's first, I think. So I'm a bit confused on the definition of uh, Sankara. Yeah. It's choices here. I mean, it's choices. I mean, it surprised me. I, I yeah. was surprised that it surprised me yeah. because I have I have uh, kind of incorporated this idea of mental factors as the tra translation of uh, this sankara. You know, yeah. so, and then in in Abhidhamma there are fifty two mental factors, and mm. that make a lot of sense to me, and it has helped me in my meditation. So now I, I want to understand a bit more what is the actual sutta definition and yeah. what's choices. 
Yeah, okay. Because there's also an intention in Abhidharma, which yeah. is a universal mental factor. And Chetana. Chetana, yeah. 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 All yeah. different words like Chetasika. Is yeah. there a word Chetasika in Sutras? No, no, it's Abhidharma term. Yeah. yeah, that's why. So, okay, then, then the, yeah. the whole concluding question yeah. is yeah. what should we do with our <laughs> Abhidharma knowledge? Yeah. Yeah. Should we just discard it or yeah. you know, what, what would you advise? Uh, I would say, I, I, the thing is that uh, uh, discard it. I mean, some people say it is useful uh, with the Abhidhamma knowledge, uh, but uh, you know the thing is that the Buddha gave us certain teachings, and uh, because the Buddha is the originator of everything, his teachings are by far the most important ones. Uh, everything is founded in the teaching of the Buddha. And uh, the problem with the Abhidhamma teaching is that we don't really know who made these teachings. Uh, they are anonymous authors, uh, and so to place as much emphasis on a teaching given by anonymous authors as the teaching of the Buddha is kind of uh, it's a bit dangerous, yeah, because you don't really know where it's coming from. Uh, so I would say, you know, if the Abhidhamma is helpful, sometimes you can use it, but always go back to the suttas as the main understanding of what Buddhism is about. And Abhidhamma should be at the best secondary here. Uh, so when it comes to the idea of Sankara, no, the Sankara, the idea in the Abhidhamma, because they, they need to classify all these Chittasika somehow, they need to classify in different categories. And so a large number of factors that you find kind of here and there in the sutta, they kind of put lump it under Sankara. And uh, what you will notice is that many of these things, like, for example, manasikara is part of sankara in the, in the Abhidhamma. Manasikara means attention, right? And of course, when it comes to attention, attention is driven to some extent by in, in, intention or by the will, because you have to place your attention somewhere. So, sankara, so uh, chaitana is an aspect of attention. Uh, and that is why it is lumped together in sankara, because there is an aspect of choice, an aspect of intention, inside intention. And the same thing with Vitaka, for example, which also I think is an aspect of Sankara in the Abhidhamma. So they, many of these ideas, many of these things, they have a certain aspect of, uh, of intention. And that's why they're lumped together uh, into the idea of Sankara. And you will notice that in the five Khandas, uh, yeah, it doesn't have to say it, there's no Chaitana there in the five Khandas. There is no Vitaka. These are, these are missing. Yeah. And that is precisely maybe because they, they uh, are. Um, partly lumped together in Sankara. But I would say something like Vitaka, it is not just Sankara, it is more than Sankara, because it's also a thought. Yeah? And what is a thought? Well, part of what a thought is, is also a perception. Yeah? Because you are perceiving something, yeah? you, have, you are verbalizing something, that's a thought. And that verbalization is a particular perception about something. Yeah? So I would say that, yes, in the Abhidhamma, it places Vitaka under Sankara, but I would say in reality, it goes a little bit across many different categories, a little bit of perception, a little bit of Sankara, a little bit of a number of things. Probably maybe a feeling also comes in there, yeah? But some thoughts make you happy, other thoughts make you miserable, depending on what you think, yeah? yeah? And, so, uh, that's, and so when you come to the suttas, the definition of Sankara in the suttas, uh, uh, it is always said to be uh, uh, Rupa Sanchetana, um, uh, uh, sorry, now no, I've got to get this right. It, it, it's often translated as I think Rupa Sanchetana, Sadda Sanchetana. It is, I think it is a Sanchetana in relation to the, uh, uh, to the six senses. Uh, yeah, so you have, a, you have, in other words, when you have an intention, it always somehow relates to the six senses. Uh, so you have an intention in this way. So it's basically defined as Sanchetana, which is Chetana. And Chetana is intention. So Sankara in the suttas basically is the same as intention. And intention is really about the will, yeah, the will of human being. It's like kind of whenever you will something, yeah, it's called volition often in the, in the English language as a more kind of technical term. Uh, you will, that is when you're willing means directing your mind. That's what willing means. Uh, and choices and willing are very similar things. Uh, when you make a choice, uh, you are willing a certain thing, willing a certain outcome. Uh, but a choice is a very ordinary word. And that's why I think Bantu uh, Sudra to use it in this context, because it's a very ordinary word. You're making a choice. You're making a, you're willing something. You're deciding something. You're making an intention. So Sankara, when it comes to the five khandas, that's what it basically means in the suttas. It's a similar, it's synonymous with Chaitana, which is intention. Yeah. It's narrower, but uh, you can also, it's narrower in one sense, but you can argue that all of these other 52 or whatever it is, uh, they have often have an aspect of Chaitana to them. Uh, and that's why they're grouped together, I think, like that. Uh. So, that, so the most important uh, meaning of Sankara in the suttas is will. 
uh, dependent origination, the second factor of dependent origination is sankara, yeah, sankara, pacha, vinyana, etc. That also is the will. It is uh, choices that you make. And those choices that you make, that's how you make kamma, right? That then uh, gives rise to rebirth in the future. So vinyana and uh, nama rupa and these kind of things. Uh, so that is the, uh, the main meaning. Sankaras, however, is a very useful term in, uh, 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 you know, in the suttas. It is used in kind of many different ways. And another way that it is used is used, for example, the sabbe sankara, sabbe sankara anicca, or sabbe sankara dukkha. Yeah? Uh, and in that context, it does not just mean the will. That context it means all phenomena. So sankara can mean either a conditioned phenomenon or it can mean the will. So either the things that create the world or that which is created. Yeah, sankara creates because intention creates karma, so it, it creates things in the future. But that thing which is created is also called sankara. So uh, in, te- in, ke- in the case of sabbe sankara anicca, it actually refers to any phenomenon which has been created by other sankaras in the past. Uh, yeah. So that, that's closer to mental formations then. I mean, that definition of sankara is closer to mental so I mean, okay. I don't like to, I don't like the translation mental formation because to me it doesn't mean anything. I, you know, but anyway, yeah. Please okay. carry on. Me, yeah. It means something. It means something. Okay, good. Meditate, okay. okay, that's what you see. You yeah. see formations like you know anger or you know the mind states that come up. To me, that's what it means. Uh, now I see the importance of understanding correctly because yeah. like when I meditate, yeah. then, then this becomes my yeah. view. You know, my understanding, which will become wrong if it's like the wrong definition. Yeah, but it doesn't mean mental formations in that way, things that arise in the mind. It doesn't actually mean that, Sankara. It means, uh, it means conditioned phenomena. It either means will or it means conditioned phenomena. But conditioned phenomena, is also what arises in your mind is conditioned it's, it's phenomena. Part of, it's part of it, but it's not all of it. Yeah? It is part of conditioned phenomena. But when you say mental formation, you are narrowing it down to certain, certain things. You mean, you mean uh, the world as well? The everything, formations in the world as Everything well. is conditioned phenomena. So Absolutely. how do you distinguish yeah. then? Is yeah. that you mean there is an elaboration in some of the suttas about the five pandas? That's how you know that that yeah. in particular sankara means. Yeah, they are defined in this way in the suttas. Oh, so. Yeah. Which, can you give me one? Maybe I'll go back. I can even bring it up for you on the screen so you can see it straight away. Okay. Let's see if we can find it. Uh, like if I can remember which sutta it is. That's always the question uh, because there are so many suttas, you know. Uh, and uh, so let's see if we can find it straight to fairly quickly. Uh, um, it's too large. Uh, can anyone remember why in? How you can you remember the in the, which sutta this this is in? Uh, defined in. Uh. Kanda Sangyuta, and I think it's seventy nine or something like that. Kanda Sangyuta. Let's have a look. Yeah. Um, perfected ones, lion, itchy. Yeah. Yeah, so here we go, I think. Yeah, definitions of the five khandas. So here we go. The sutta is called Ichi. So, so <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so here we have one definite uh, choice. And uh, why do you call them choices? Yeah, why are they called so- so- choices? Uh, and um, <laughs> so, so this is. So this is one of them. This is not, not the one I was looking for. There's a couple of def- different definitions in the suttas. So this is one of them. Let's see. Let's go to, I wonder if 57 is the one. Let's have a look. Yeah, 57. This one is a bit more, uh, not as obvious, perhaps. Uh, um, what is feeling? Yeah. What are perceptions? What are choices? So here you go. So here, here, here is this, this is a really good one to understand it from. What happened to the sutta? What happened to the feeling, feelings, feelings, feelings? You can see here it's all defined in quite a bit of detail. What is perception? Originally from conduct, what are choices? So here you are. What are choices? What are sankaras? You see sankara over there, yeah? And then it says, there are these six classes of intention, yeah? Chaitana kaya. Kaya is a class. Chaitana is intention, yeah? 
And the first one is, here you go, Rupa Sanchetana. Yeah, intention regarding forms or retention for forms. Yeah. Dhamma san, and then you have rupa san, and then you have sadda san chaitanya. You can see it's it's, uh, it's contracted here. The pe means payela means contraction. So then you have sadda san chaitanya, intention regarding sounds, intention regarding smells, regarding tastes, regarding touches, and the last one regarding ideas, which are the mental things you were talking about. Uh, these are called choices. These are called sankharas. Uh, yeah. This is uh, this is. Uh, uh, Sangyutta Nikaya 2257. 22 is the Kanda Sangyutta. Yeah. You can see I'm trustworthy, you see? <laughs> yeah, so this is, this is quite nice. Yeah. It's good to ask because you should never trust anyone 100%. So it's good to see it with your own eyes and then you can actually know what's going on. So that's good. Yeah, the right kind of attitude. <clears throat> uh, good morning, Ajahn. Uh, many thanks for your teachings. Very grateful indeed. Um, uh, just wondering, um, and this has been kind of uh, ever going debate in my mind. Um, if we do not have free will, are we at mercy of our anusayas? Um, and I, uh, uh, I noticed that um, uh, Lord Buddha did say uh, in the Atakari Sutta that you know we we do have some um, uh, choice over intentions. We can choose not to engage with certain acts. So we do have volition and intention, as he says in the sutta. Uh, but in my mind, all that is also conditioned by a lot of things, not only your past karmas, but your present things, like your genetics, your socioeconomic status, your intelligence, and you know, and all that in some way is also uh, uh, influenced by what has happened in the past. So um, I, I'm not, uh, if, uh, and the, the question comes, which has been answered so many times, but still not very clear that if we do not actually have any will, you know, yeah. uh, and then how can we actually, uh, you know, come out of this circle? Okay, yeah. yeah we people. have will, right? Will is always there. We have intention. Uh, we have choices. Uh, the question is, what, where do those choices come from? Where does the will come from? Uh, that is really the kind of the tricky thing to get your mind around. Once you see, see that one, you understand how this works. Uh, but definitely there are choices. Uh, but why are you making a choice? Uh, yeah, and that, that whole point, you're making a choice because it is conditioned from the past. Uh, and that is kind of the thing. So it is not so much that there aren't choices, and choices are actually very important. We have to make the right choices, make the wrong choices, and you are stuffed. Yeah, yeah that's it. You are in, in difficulties. Uh, so choices matter. But why do we make them? Well, one reason you make them is because of the Buddha. The Buddha taught the Dhamma, so you kind of start listening. That's one of the reasons why you make choices, yeah? Coming here, meditating, all these kind of things. Uh, are those choices ultimately free? I mean, I think, it, I think in, in Buddhism, the whole idea of freedom of choice doesn't make any sense. What do you mean freedom of choice? Where is that freedom going to come from anyway? Uh, I mean, what is uh, your choice obviously comes because of all kinds of things working on us in a certain way, and then the outcome is a choice. Freedom would mean that there is a self, yeah? The self which stands outside of cause and conditions and makes a choice independent of cause and conditions. But if there is no self, then of course, that choice that is made must come because of all the cause and conditions that work on you. And then that results in a particular way of doing things. But it's a very complicated thing. It's very, very complicated. That's why it is unpredictable. We don't know what's going to happen next. You don't know if I'm going to have a sip of coffee or not next, yeah? I don't even I don't even know that I have no so it's just very complex, and so that, and, and this is uh, concerning. Yeah, it means how easily you can be sidetracked from what is important. The cause and condition becoming different and suddenly you are. It's actually very dangerous. And so what once you start to understand how cause and condition our choices are. It actually makes you more interested in practicing a path. That becomes another cause and condition for making good cause and making good choices, right? And so this is the this is kind of the critical thing. In men, in some ways, we live as if we have free will. We live as if we are able to make choices independently. That's how you live. And then you kind of make the most of that to make to, to do good things in the world. Yeah. So, so I guess somebody who is not exposed to dhamma at all, you know. Who doesn't like? How would he or she, um, you know, kind of make the right choices? You know, because they're conditioned. We do have, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
that's, that's, that's exactly why they're so dangerous, right? So once you are out of the Dhamma, once you are doing something completely different, uh, you don't know when they're going to come back in again. Huh? It depends on cause and conditions. Uh. When so, the condi cause and conditions are right, then they will come back in again. Huh? So till we attain uh, Shotapana, actually we are still uh, yeah. liable to be overwhelmed yeah. uh, by all this Mara and you know, still be overwhelmed by our fast conditioning. Yeah? Absolutely. It's, it's scary, isn't it? Uh? I think follow up from yeah. that question yeah. that Jan yeah. is also yeah. uh, kind of difficult for us to wrap it around because we always believe that choices are ours and therefore when we say we uh, don't have a choice but to make that choice and will is not free but it is conditioned mm. then of course uh, somebody will argue and says what hope is there for for, yeah, well, for, for, for everyone you know for uh, if, if everything is, is, is pretty much just um, causes and conditions uh, I, I would yeah. say I would say it's the other way around. I would say that if you don't understand the uh, the causality behind will, then there is no hope. Yeah. But if you understand clearly the conditionality, then you will make sure you put into place the right cause and conditions. Uh, so hope actually increases if you understand that. Uh, if you don't understand, that's when you have a real problem because then you think that you are independent. You think you can make free choices. Uh, that then you kind of become much more relaxed about everything. That is where the danger actually arises. Uh, and so I would say, yeah, it is a, it's a positive thing if you understand these things in the right way. Yeah. yeah. Select all. <laughs> yeah, don't select all. Select yeah? all. That's, that's, that's a very bad idea. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> I, <laughs> it, yeah, I, I thought I could trust you to give a good. That, that, that's why I'm. I'm <laughs> not sure if I believe. <laughs> okay, anyway, no, that's, that's good. Okay, I think. Okay, one quick question. Okay. Ajahn, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to bring you back to um, the, the the last one before Pena Pindu Pa Masu. Yeah. Well um, yeah. There's this part, the last bit about um, and and how is the perception of impermanence to be developed and cultivated? Yeah. Um, I I was so joyful when I when I read this when Buddha said such, you you contemplate such is form mm. or such is appearance, such is the origin of appearance and such the ending of appearance, mm. and. And it goes on to feelings and, 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 and choices and whatnot. Yeah. I was so joyful because that is actually the template of uh, four noble truths that I never know. Mm -hmm. It can be used this way. Mm -hmm. That that mm -hmm. that I forgot to ask the question when mm -hmm. this was discussed because mm -hmm. I was just, just so joyful. So mm -hmm. I, I wonder beside uh contemplating uh the the, the impermanent but uh perception of impermanence, yeah. what else can I use this, this template to, to contemplate on? Yeah, That's my uh, question. Yeah, yeah you're, you're right. It, it, it is actually very, it is basically the Four Noble Truths. Yeah? So you have such is form. And uh, so, of course, such is form. Well, in the first Noble Truth, it is Dukkha, right? So the form is Dukkha, Panchapadana Kanda, Panchapadana Kanda, Sankitena, Panchapadana Kanda, Dukkha, in brief, the five um, uh, uh, aspects of personality subject to attachment are dukkha. So uh, you can see it as dukkha, and uh, this also has to do with, I, I talked about it more in, in terms of things changing, but this also has to do with rebirth, yeah? the or origin of form, the origin of feeling. It orig originates every time we get reborn. Uh, and then when you die, it comes to a temporary end. Uh, so it, ha it has the origination and then the ending. Actually, the real ending is really when you when the uh, you become an arahant, yeah, and then things come to a final end and they don't re arise again in the future. That's really kind of the real ending. That's the third noble truth, yeah, the Niroda Satcha, and uh, the ending when it doesn't, you attain Nibbana and then it doesn't re arise. Yeah. So uh, you can use very much, as you say, the template of the four noble truths, so contemplate each one as suffering, yeah. the original suffering being rebirth and the ending being kind of the. Uh, and the taking away of craving for these things because you understand that they are dukkha. That is a nice way of, uh, of, of contemplating that and using, using those things. Uh, so, uh, yeah. And that's also a way of understanding it. I think one of the uh, kind of uh, 
things that makes it difficult uh, is that these should not be too intellectual, these kind of contemplations. Uh, sometimes we try to use them intellectual and try to understand what is form, what is perception, but it doesn't go very far. Uh, and the right way of really understanding these things is through meditation practice. Uh, that is where you start to understand how these things come, you know, what they actually are. So form, for example, yeah, is basically is your perception of the breath. If you're doing breath meditation, right, that's form. It has a certain, the breath has a certain appearance, if you like. Yeah. And then as the body fades away and the five senses fade away, that is the fading away of form in meditation. And when it fades away, then you understand what it is, yeah, because it actually is disappearing, yeah. And the same thing with, like, take something like choices or volitions or intentions. They're almost always in the mind. That's why the mind is moving so much, because we're always doing things. And then when the mind becomes very peaceful, actually all those intentions and choices, they are gone. That is why the mind is peaceful, because you're not choosing anymore. You're not doing anything anymore. You're not make, using the willpower anymore. And so then you start to understand what choices really are, this will, because it's gone. It's again like this idea of the tadpole born in water, one day you're out of water, you're a frog. Yay, I'm a frog. Yeah. <laughs> no. So you're a frog. Yeah, you understand what choices are because you have come out of choices. You have come out of form. You have come out of certain perceptions, certain feelings. You understand what they are for that reason. So the most powerful thing is actually meditation practice. This is where you really start to understand these things. It is not so much an intellectual exercise. It is about deepening the meditation. Then when you come out, you understand it. And so when we talk about samatha and vipassana, uh, which, uh, you know, we'll call it samatha and, or samadhi and panya or whatever, you calm the mind, the calmer the mind is, uh, the more ability you will have to see things clearly uh, when, you, when you emerge from that mind, that mental state. Uh, you will understand what actually happened during meditation, etc. That is the most, most powerful way of doing it. Uh, yeah. Okay. No. Oh, one more thing I want to you yeah. were talking about Patna. Patna, okay. Yeah, we, yeah. I went to uh, uh, Besali it's more than 10 years ago with a Chinese picnic and on the way back, the uh, Sri Lankan monk sent us in the car and uh, the, uh, the, the driver took us to the museum in yeah. Patna. Mm. And we were looking at it and then I saw in the... Uh, in a glass yeah. cage, and they said that Buddha's coffin. Yeah, 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 Buddha it, relics. Yeah, and you have to pay, you know, uh, yeah. to go see. But we didn't pay to go see. But uh, yeah. how is it gonna be the Buddha's coffin? Because in those days, even even today, you know, the Indian world, you know, they cremate. Yeah, not the body is not in the coffin. Yeah. It's just, you know, lying there with uh, all the... Did you see the coffin? No, I would, we, he had to pay to go see. Maybe, he, are you sure he didn't mean a relic? Uh, relic no, it relic said quarry? coffin. It said Buddha's coffin. Maybe he was using the wrong word. Maybe he meant relic. Quarry. Yeah, yeah. I didn't, so I, I still, you know, wonder about it today. I said, how is it going to be yeah. Buddha's coffin? Because in those days, even today, the yeah. Indian not put in the coffin. To what, what, I, what, what I know is that they, for a long time they had some uh, relics at the muse museum in Patna who were supposed to be real Buddha relics. Uh. No, it said coffin. That's why I still wonder yeah. until today. Yeah. You know. yeah. uh, we, we didn't have any yeah. money. You know, but, to call. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but what, what, I, what I know is that he, they, they had relics there. So I, I know that much, that's for sure, but that they had that. Uh, and maybe he was referring to something like that, even Though he said coffin, maybe he was referring to the relics. Because that's I, I know about that part. I never heard about the coffin before. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we had monks who have visited there and they saw the relics, but no one's I never heard of any, anyone seeing coffin. Never saw a coffin before. I think that's kind of a dodgy, something dodgy. Uh, yeah. The, according to the story, the Buddha was certainly cremated uh, when he, after dying. So uh, that's what we know. Yeah. Yeah.